drove like out bulbs. Oh god, that sounds like that. Oh my god, like I pulled it. <laughs> Screw stand, but I'm gonna put it on. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to another uh, talk in the Northwest Database Society series. Uh, today is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Paris Kudris from the University of Wisconsin. And Paris has recently looked at, at some uh, very interesting questions on how to price um, machine, le more, uh, machine learning results. And he's going to talk about this project now. Thanks, Dan, uh, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be back. Uh, so today what I'm going to talk about is model-based pricing for machine learning in a data market and this is joint work with my student Ling Jiao Chen and Arun Kumar who's a professor at UCSD. Uh, this is a paper that's going to be presented in uh, this year's Sigma. Okay. okay, so let's start with uh, some motivation. So uh, data for, there is data for sale everywhere. So there is a commodity that people sell and buy. Uh, you can look at companies that sell financial data, like Exignite, Bloomberg. Uh, there's companies that sell social, social data. So this CNIP audience is a, essentially a feature that Twitter offers where people can, can go and define an audience of Twitter users uh, by uh, geographic location or by gender or by some interest, and then basically get some statistics about the, the tweets of, of, uh, of these users. We have uh, common ceiling data streams, or even pl planet analytics, or satellite images, or maps, and so on. So, um, okay, so this data is for sale, but how how is this uh, is data sold? So, current pricing schemes are really simple, and they're not aware of how people are are, are using this data in downstream tasks. Okay, so a downstream task you know, could be a query that uh, that you ask, or a machine learning model that you run, and so on. Okay, so Pricing seem agnostic to what's happening with this data. So this means that the schemes are of the pricing could be of the following form. You know, you either buy the whole data set or not, or you know, there's some predefined views that, that you have to pay. So for example, imagine there's a predicate, and then you pay according to the predicate, and then uh, what data you get is the data satisfies this predicate. OK, so, um, so why, why is it bad to price this way? Why is it, uh, is it not? Uh, good. So the reason is that there, there are two factors, both from the perspective of the seller and from the perspective of the buyer. So, so first of all, um, by, by having only this limited pricing method, this means that the seller loses revenue. Why? Because, for example, imagine that a user is interested in, in buying some data, but they cannot afford to buy the, the whole data set. Okay? So then they won't buy it. This means that the user uh, the, the, the seller is actually going to lose the revenue from the people who cannot aff afford to buy this data, but they could afford perhaps to buy a smaller query or a, s a smaller uh, part of this data. Okay, so that the first thing is, you know, the seller loses revenue. Second is that, you know, buyers may not afford to buy something that they, uh, they can run some, some task on. Okay, so data becomes inaccessible, valuable data becomes inaccessible to buyers. So, um, so what we claim is that to solve these things, you need to have some sort of fine-grained pricing where you, you can price in a much smaller granularity than current pricing schemes. And we kind of already did, uh, did it for queries, and this is what we did with, with Dan, uh, I don't know, six, seven or eight years ago we started. Uh, we call that query-based pricing, and then the idea here is that basically you don't pay for the data set, you pay for queries that you run the data set, and then for each query you'll, you'll have to pay some price. And the price you pay reflects on how much information you're learning from this query. Okay? Uh, but now we want to look at the different types of tasks you can run, which is, which is machine learning models. Okay? So, so users very often buy rich structured data, so imagine rel relational data right, with, with many features, uh, and they use that data to train their models. Okay? So now someone could ask, okay, why can't you use any of the techniques you have developed for query-based pricing to also do that? And there are two main differences. The first one is that computation in machine learning is often non-deterministic, right? So uh, in a query-based setting, you ask a SQL query, you get back exactly the same result, so nothing changes, right? In machine learning computation, you, you have a lot of randomness, right? So you may get different results uh, uh, based on what algorithms you're running. Second, even most important factor is that 
now accuracy becomes a really, really important factor on how you price things, okay? So again, equity-based pricing, you get a, uh, an answer, there is no error, right? You ask something, you get back the result. Now in machine learning, you'll get a model, and then this model will, will have some, uh, some error, okay? Question, yes? Are the users buying the uh, structured data that is used to train the models, or are they body buying the um, models after training them? Excellent question. We, we, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So your answer going to be uh, uh, your question going to be answered in, uh, in the next few slides. Okay. And by the way, feel free to interrupt and ask any any questions you like. Okay. Okay. So so these are the the reasons why we we, we cannot apply the same techniques. Okay. So okay. So what is the problem statement? What are we trying to do? So our long-term vision is to develop a data market when we can directly sell ML models to, to the user. So a user will come, say, I want to learn the model, and basically on, on this data, and then we can actually do that directly, okay? So, um, so that's the long-term vision. Uh, we are far away from that, okay? So what I'm going to present today is just a first small step towards go getting to that goal. And, uh, okay, so that's the goal. What kind of uh, desiderata do, do we want from, uh, from that type of market, okay? So first, we want to have formal guarantees. And I'm going to talk about them in more detail, what kind of formal guarantees we want. We, of course, want this pricing to be efficient and practical. So we don't want a very heavy framework that is computationally uh, really hard to do, OK? So we want it to be, uh, to be able to be to employ it in, uh, applied in practice. And as we said, it is important to, allow, to be able to do fine-grained pricing, OK? So we want to be able to to cater to the user's needs, and as we said, that has a benefit both, both for the seller and, and for the buyer. So what is the key idea that we're using? The key idea is that in order to achieve this fine grained pricing, we are going to offer model instances of different accuracy. Right? So we uh, will vary accuracy, and then we'll make the, pri the price will depend, first of all, on what kind of model you're interested in, and also on the accuracy of this model. Okay, so of course, better accuracy should mean higher price, right? So you, you want to pay more for something that's more accurate, that's going to help you more. And we call this setting model-based pricing, or MBB for short, and this is because you're pricing according to a model. Okay, so that's why analog to query-based pricing, it's, it's model-based pricing. Okay, any questions so far? Great. Okay, so, so this is the, the outline of the talk. So most of, uh, of the time I'm going to spend on defining the framework. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a bit about qu revenue optimization, I have a bunch of experiments, and talk uh, about future work if, if time allows. Yes? So by accuracy, you mean like accuracy on like some test set, or how do you define accuracy? Great. I'm going to answer okay. this question in a bit. Yes. Yes? Would we charge the same for a white box model, like a decision tree or forest as a black box model like a neural network if they provided the same accuracy? Very good question. We're also going to answer that in, in a bit. <laughs> be, be patient. <laughs> I have a long list of questions that we need to answer. I know, I know, I know. And some of them, uh, I don't have an answer, but they're more like future open problems, OK? But many of the questions will be answered uh, in time. OK. So uh, OK. So this is kind of a, a, an overview of um, of, the, uh, of how, how the market works. So basically, we have three entities. We have a seller, a uh, buyer, and the data market or broker, OK? So the data market, the broker is essentially the mediator between the seller and the buyer. Uh, and in order to make sure that the broker is incentivized to, uh, to help the seller, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that basically the broker will get a cut from the seller's revenue. Okay, so for example, they may have a contract that say, you know, I'm, I'm going to get the broker will get five percent of what sales they have, and then clearly what what the broker will do is incentive is to maximize the revenue uh, of, of the seller. Okay, so these their interests are completely aligned. Now, it could be the case that these two are different entities, or it could be it's the same entity, right? So you, it could be a company that you have the data and you're actually also the broker that that's selling the data. Okay. So it could be separate, or they could be the same. Um, OK, so the seller provides a data set D to the, to the market. So here we got, of course, multiple sellers. Then 
what the broker will construct, and we'll, we'll talk in detail how we do that, it's what we call a price error curve, right? So this is essentially, and that's something that, that's going to be visible to the buyer, it tells you uh, how does the price uh, depend on the error, right? And that's for a fixed, for a fixed model. Uh, okay, for a, a different model, you get, get different, different curves in some sense. So, so now, what's the final thing? So uh, the buyer will basically you know, choose some point here, and the broker will, will send an instance, train on this data set to the buyer, and the buyer will, will pay, will pay the, uh, the market. And then, of course, the market will you know, give the revenue or whatever percentage is to the seller and keep, and keep the rest. OK? So that's kind of the, uh, the overview of how it, wo how it works. And now we're, we're going to discuss into much more detail uh, uh, how things work. Yes? Why do you need a broker? Uh, why do you need a broker? Because you can have multiple sellers, right? So you need some entity to basically coordinate how, how this happens. Uh, so, I mean, th there is a any reason why, why do you need a market for anything, right? So essentially, you need some central entity that's going to gather all the data and coordinate the sale, uh, you know, pur purchasing and selling of the data. Why do you have a stock market and, you know, don't think in individually with, uh, with everyone? Uh, okay. A seller that just sells its own models and takes zero cut, right? It's yeah, I mean, you, you could, I mean, you don't, I mean, as I said, the market could be the same as a seller, right? So it doesn't need to be different, but. Uh, the question here is that uh, the broker, can the broker take multiple data sets and aggregate the information together to get a better model and then sell it? That's a really good question. Uh, we haven't looked at that. So per, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, you could, you could imagine that you want some kind of capability like that. But then it's it's very unclear how do you do how do you split the the revenue that you get, right? So if if the buyer pays this much money to the broker, how are you going to split the revenue to the multiple sellers that contribute to data, right? So that, that's that's the that's a hard question. Uh, yes. You determine the price by uh, the error, so, but you, can you really guarantee the buyer uh, this specific uh, error? We don't know what, uh, how we will use the model for, for prediction. So why should the buyer really uh, actually believe that uh, your statements of these errors? Assuming even if you have collected these errors that they, they are uh, for the training set that you try them on, uh, mm -hmm. how, how do you guarantee this error to the buyer? Because this is essentially what he pays for. Right. So that's an excellent question. So, so what we're going to do is that basically the buyer will specify how it wants the broker to measure the error. So the buyer will, will say to the broker, that's how I want you to measure the error. And we're going to pay according to that. OK? Uh, yes? I'm a little confused. So you give the data to the buyer, and, but they can do whatever model. No, you don't give the data. You give only the model. Yes, oh. so you're there in the instance. You never give the data. It, that's why it's called model-based pricing and not data pricing, right? So you're only returning the model. So you're only paying for the model, not for the data. Uh, <laughs> OK. So uh, yeah, you first. Oh, so just to clarify, to make sure, uh, the price error curve is generated per buyer. Uh, per, right. So b no, but if, OK, if multiple buyers are interested in exactly the same model, they're going to, you're going to get exactly the same curve, right? So it's a public, it's a public one, in some sense. But for a different model, uh, so if you're learning like linear regression or logistic regression, you're going to get a different curve. Okay. Uh, yes. So in machine learning, a lot of uh, you know error and accuracy depends on you know fine tuning a particular machine learning model. Right. Also, right. So is your model incentivizing the broker to actually you know fine tune a model to give you a lesser error? Excellent question. So, so what we're going to do here, and that's why I said it's a long uh, first step towards a, a long-term vision, we're going to assume that the buyer will specify a particular model. And then I'll, I'll talk exactly about how we compute uh, the model instance that you return in there. But a very interesting question is what happens if you don't know what, what the best model is and you want to try different things, right? So for example, what if you want to do feature selection? Uh, so. So these are these are uh, uh, these are things I'm going to discuss in the future work or how to do these things. But that's an excellent question. Uh, then you had a question or, okay, yes. Right, so, like, like does the buyer need to understand what this, this data set D is about? Because like you know the seller can kind of trick by putting out some data set where it shows like perfect accuracy on like. So here, of course, there is a trust between the buyer and the broker, right? So 
so the buyer trusts that the broker will actually compute the right thing and report the right thing. Uh, are you asking that, or are you asking if you actually know what kind of data you're, tra you're, being, you're training your model on? Yeah, does the buyer actually know what D is? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, can know the yeah, it knows the schema, for example, uh, but of course not the data, right? But it knows the schema, the features. Uh, I, I mean, I'm going to get that to, uh, to the next slide, well, but. I guess, like, the buyer needs to kind of understand, like, whether my set of data is, like, the same or similar to D, right? Because, like, you know, it might have different distribution or something like that, and then, like, you know, the accuracy curve that is being plotted against D might be different when I'm actually running it against my own set of data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I need to somehow know, know some sort of resemblance, right? Yeah, I guess. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's uh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Along the same lines, um, the accuracy is usually determined on the test set. Yes. Who decides what the test set is? Great question. Uh, uh, next slide. I'm going to answer the next slide. Okay. Uh, last question, and then I think I need to move to. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just an overview slide. <laughs> 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 Let's move. Okay. Take, take away lesson. Don't have overuse slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that's not a good takeaway lesson, by the way. Okay. Good. So, so let's go. So what I'll do is I'll go over each one of these one by one, and then talk about some details and how the market operation works. Okay. So, so here, so the seller will offer a relational data set D for sale, right? And we assume that the data set will, will look something like that. So these are your features, and then you also have labels. And basically, then you can you can split this data set on a training and, and, and testing part. Okay, so all this is information that uh, the seller has. Okay, now someone can ask, okay, what if you actually have you know some data uh, as a buyer that is different than the, the data of the seller? Okay, so something that you can do is actually instead of using this testing data that is provided by the seller, you can actually give your own, your own test data to the, to the buyer to compute the error that, uh, that you have, okay? Uh, of course, these things will work kind of, you want, uh, from, a, from a learning point of view, you kind of want this and this to be kind of from the same distribution to make sense, uh, otherwise it won't work. But for the purpose of now, just think that all of your data, your training and your testing data is actually uh, uh, on, the, on the seller side. Okay, and everything will be computed here. Errors accuracy will be computed here, either here or here, depending on, on what what uh, what the buyer wants. Okay, so the broker. So what the broker will do is actually will present to the buyers a, a menu of choices, and the choices are of two flavors. So the first flavor are possible ML models that you could learn. So it could be you know you can do logistic regression, you can do least squares, you can do SVM, and so on. Uh, so uh, in basically what, what we're doing so far in this work is I'm going to only talk about generalized linear models um, and our techniques work for this. But, but you, know, you could imagine any type of model you could, uh, you, you could have it as a possible menu, okay? And then what the, the buyer can also choose what kind of error function they want to use for both training and testing, right? So that can be specified by the, uh, by the buyer. So we're going to use two types of error functions. Uh, lambda is used for training, right, to train your model. Uh, and epsilon is used for testing. And you can define that however you want. So you can say, you know, this is, I can define this function on my training set or my testing set or some other testing set. It can be 0, 1 loss. It could be some other type of loss. You're, you're free to choose whatever you want as a buyer, OK, depending on how do you want your error to be measured, OK? And this work we restrict to strictly converse log functions. So that this is uh, uh, what we're going to talk about. Questions? OK. So when you, when you give more details, you get less questions. <laughs> OK. So the broket will also do the following. And this is one of the, of the key ideas that uh, I want you to take away from this talk. Uh, so you release a model instance, but you actually, before you release it, you uh, put it through a randomized mechanism. Okay, uh, it's gonna be K. And what is the idea here? Is that this randomized mechanism will essentially uh, take the optimal model. So this is the optimal model, learn on data set D with respect to uh, some error that you want to minimize lambda on this, on this data set. So you're going to take the optimal model and then you're going to put it through this randomized mechanism that's going to add some noise in the model. Okay, so it's going to make it more uh, basically less accurate. So the idea is that you have this parameter delta that we call the noise control parameter, 
And essentially, the more noise you're adding, right, the, more, uh, the less accurate your model is, and the cheaper it will be, OK? So the delta controls the amount of noise you add, so it, it controls uh, the error that you get, OK? Now, because this, this uh, mechanism is randomized, the error that you're going to compute is not actually a, a, a deterministic error. It's, a, it's an expected error, because it's, it's averaged over the randomness of, of the mechanism, OK? So, uh, so here, what, what I'm saying is that you, this, uh, this is essentially, imagine a, a distribution of error you can add. And in, in practice, what we're going to do is we, we're going to add random Gaussian noise to the model. Okay, so uh, that's what you can think. And here, you're basically parameterizing. So delta, you can think about as the variance of your Gaussian noise. So the bigger delta is the more variance you're going to add. So the more uh, noise you're going to add to your model. Uh, and basically, then you're what we are going to do, so here, uh, I have it in the most general form, but we're basically going to add this vector to, to your model, OK? So we're going to add noise to each of the coordinates of the vector that, that of the model you're learning. Yes? So does this mean that even if buyers want an inaccurate model, the broker still has to go through and like tune the model to make it optimal? Yeah, but you do it once, right? Okay. You did once. I mean, that's one of the effectiveness that if you computed your optimal model, then you can sell any point by just adding random noise, which is extremely fast. So you don't need to train separately for a level of accuracy. You train once, and then you're just adding noise. Okay. Yes? Is that possible for the user to reverse engineer if you know how you do this, like to from the release model to get a better model? Excellent. I mean, that, that's going to be the formal guarantees. We're going to show that if you, if you do it in the right way, you won't be able to, to recover back the model. Okay. Of course, here, we're talking about an expected error, right, which means that we are going to price according to the expected error and not the actual error that you get. So it may be that you know, a user gets a more accurate or less accurate error, but you are get, you're, you're paying according to the expected error. OK? Yes? So this is under the assumption that your data is uh, clean, uh, that all of the data is uh, homogeneous in terms of its accuracy, in terms of the quality of its labels. Um, Usually, not all of your data will be have the same uh, quality. Mm -hmm. You will uh, have some data that from the start is uh, noisy. Okay. So, I would assume that. Uh, uh, so, I'm just saying that this is the this is basically the assumption that you make that uh, all of uh, that uh, you have basically all of your data is uh, homogeneous, is uh, is clean, is accurate, is uh, la labeled to the same accuracy. And so you add that uh, for each model the same distribution uh, of noise. So here we're not adding noise to the data, we're adding noise to the model yeah. that you learn. Yes. Right? Yes. So in some sense, you know, if you, if you have crappy data, you're going to get a crappy optimal model. But you don't need to do it. But you could have, uh, but you can add the noise according, basically, you don't uh, account for the noise in the data. Exactly, I don't, right? I don't. So, I mean, because that's the data you have. So, uh, I mean, you, and, and you will tell to the user, you know, that's the best accuracy I can get. So, if you don't like it, don't buy it. I can make it even worse, but I can make it better. I mean, if your data can make it any better, you can't do anything. You can find a different data set, but then, you know, maybe the other seller with a more accurate data set will actually price, price it higher, right? Yes. I'm yeah. Just yeah. Yes, if yes, I yes. would have bought the data directly, not through a model, then I would have paid by the uh, quality of the data, yeah. right? Yeah, I would yeah, have yeah, said yeah. I would pay less for uh, less quality. But here right. you assume that all of the data is of very high quality, it's homogeneous, and then you just said the noise I mean, in I order to you, make You don't have to make this assumption to for, uh, for, the, for this, all this to work. Uh, in, in the sense that you know the you give back a price error curve to the to the buyer, so you know if the buyer looks at the curve and sees that there is no point that they like to buy, they just won't buy it, right? And if there is someone else that offers a higher one, they go there and buy it. Um, so yeah, so there is no you don't need an assumption of high high quality the data is because the, the market and the behavior and and the users needs will control what they buy and what they not buy. Any other questions? OK, good. So uh, OK, so what, finally, the buyer, the buyer will specify the model they want to learn, which you can think about the hypothesis space, along with the error loss function, will specify a desired accuracy or error. 
and then it will get the model instance and pay pay the price to the to the market. Okay. Uh, uh, just as a concrete example, so that we are all on the same page, assume that we have the following schema. So we have demographic information, age, sex, height, and then we have some income. And let's say you want to do a least squares linear regression to predict the income based on, on these features. Okay, something really simple. Your hypothesis space is the vectors in uh, four-dimensional space. Let's say your error function, you pick your least squares loss, right? Because you're learning a least squares linear regression on the training data. And then let's say as your error function, you want to use a least squares loss, but now in your testing data. Okay? So this is something that you know I would specify that this is what I want to get. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do over the next five slides, I'm going to give you how I'm going to tell you exactly how the market operates in, in uh, uh, as uh, in a sequence of steps. Okay. So now the first thing we want to do is essentially for a fixed model. So now fix fix a model, fix a hypothesis space. What we what we what the first thing that that must happen is that the broker has to build this this curve between uh, price and error. Okay. So so how does this happen? So what what we're going to do is we're going to start from something more fundamental, which is. Uh, what we call demand and value curves. Okay, so here uh, what we have is this line is gives you the expected error, and on the left hand side you can actually see uh, what how much the buyer values you know some type of error, right? So this is zero error, so it's really high. Let's say you're willing to pay hundred dollars, and as your error uh, grows, then you want to pay less and less, right? And if it's so high, you basically you know don't care about it, you don't want to buy it. Okay. Where yes. Get, get the so this is uh, from nowhere. This is like a, and so how that would look, but it's, it doesn't come from real data. Uh, this is actually a really good question. Uh, I yeah, I don't know how I would get that from from real data, but that would be awesome if we could do that. But I don't know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so this is okay. So that basically tells you. What is the monetary value, right, as a function of the error, and that tells you what is the demand as a function of the error. Now, what do we care about demand? Because, for example, you know, most users could be interested in buying high-quality models, or it could be that you know uh, they're fine with buying something of, le of lesser quality. Okay, so this basically tells you that. So this is the percentage of the users who are interested in buying a model of that error, that, that, and so on. And you know, you all that uh, you you want all that to sum to one. You know, so there's less interest here, more interest in here. Again, this does not is not real. Uh, how a real one would look? Perhaps you think that it would maybe look constant or go like that. Uh, so this is just an example. Yes. You're, yes, you're assuming that there are, there, are, there are lots of buyers who want a really cheap and crappy model uh, because it's very cheap. Uh, here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, K kind of about the same. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah number of buyers who want a very expensive model because they need high accuracy. Yeah, but here, here, and here, the percentages are kind of the same, right? Okay. But here, it's it's smaller, right? So again, this is an example, right? This doesn't reflect anything real. It's just an example. Yes. To follow up on Shimo's question about reverse engineering, so are you going to assume that a buyer only buys a model once, or what happens if you buy it? a slightly less expensive model 100 times and try to mark yeah, someone's um, model. Have, have we, we, we're going to answer that, but mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to, to, to cheat the market this way. Uh, great. So you're starting with that, right? And now using that, you essentially want to compute the price error curve. So, so how do you do that? So the first thing you are going to do is transform uh, the ax this axis from expected error to the noise control parameter. Okay. So how are you going to do that? Basically, you're going to plot how the expected error behaves as a function of the noise control parameter. And here, I'm using the inverse of the noise control parameter. So just to make it more concrete, uh, imagine the noise control parameter as, you, as your va of the variance of your noise you're adding. Okay. So intuitively, you would expect that as you're adding more noise, your expected error increases. Okay. Of course, that's not always true. Okay. So for linear models, that is mostly true. But now, if you go to nonlinear models like you know a deep net, then that, that that assumption may not be true. So, uh, so you know you, you do this transformation, you get this one, and basically for all of all of in order for a framework to work, we must have that the, the the we must have a monotone behavior between these two things. Okay. Now, the the very nice thing is that 
this monotone behavior does not need to be theoretically monotone. If you just compute it and it's in practice monotone, that suffices for it to work. Okay? So it could be now, you know, theoretically, you could, you could show examples where you're adding more noise and you're getting something le uh, more accurate. But, you know, in practice, if you run it and it's monotone, you can, you can still use uh, all, all of that. Okay? So if you had, uh, right, so that's observation. So that's the first thing you're doing. So now uh, the value and the, and the distribution are as a function of, of this noise control parameter. And we're going to see why, why it's important you do this information in a bit. OK, so now the next thing that you do is that, OK, so you have this curve, and now you're going to do revenue optimization to find the optimal, the optimal pricing function. OK, so essentially this tells you all the information about you know, what the users want to buy, how many want to buy it, and how much they're willing to pay. So now you can just solve an uh, optimization problem and basically create uh, the curve that's going to give you the optimal pricing. OK? Um, so that's what you get. So this is, imagine some, this as an offline phase. So, so, so now you're, uh, the broker has, has its graph. Okay? So now, uh, so this is the interaction between the seller and the broker. So now the buyer comes, and they, again, the model is fixed. So we're talking about a particular model. And the buyer says, here, listen, I'm, I'm interested in basically this model and this, uh, this error function, these two error functions, right? Remember, this is the error function or that, that uh, you train, and this is the error function that you, you're testing, OK? Now, what you're going to do is that you're going to take that and, again, apply the same transformation uh, that we had here to get, again, uh, uh, the price as a function of the expected error, right? So clearly, the, the, the buyer doesn't want to see the price as a function of the noise cone parameter because that doesn't reflect anything real. They want to see it as, as uh, a function of the error that they're interested in measuring, right? Whatever they are, they want to do that. So the nice, the reason why I did this transformation is that when a buyer comes with a different type of error, let's say they want to learn, you can apply, this is fixed, and then you can apply this transformation to here and get a different graph and show them this different graph. Okay, so this is kind of a, 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 a graph that you can use for any kind of preference of the buyer without needing to recompute to do, redo all your revenue optimization. Okay, that, that's the game. Any questions so far? Yes? Do you need the demand curve, right, from the previous slide? Yeah, yeah but, but as soon as you got that, then you, you don't need it anymore, right? So the demand curve, you needed to compute your optimal price in some sense. Right. You're saying, like, you, how would you get that to demand curve? This one? No, the, the Here? Yeah. Uh, you do revenue optimization. I'm, we're going to discuss how we do that. But basically, now this is a, an, an optimization problem, right? Because you, you want to find the price. So ideally, right, what would be the optimal? The optimal would be you, you have exactly, you following exactly uh, the valuations of the buyers, right? Because selling something uh, higher, uh, means that the buyer is not going to buy it. Selling something lower means that you're going to lose this revenue, right? right. So the only, you want to get like the demand of the aggregate demand on the red line, right? I guess, for example. Here, how do you get that? Yeah. Uh, but you have to do market research. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a question in any any type of uh, market uh, you can ask, right? Any type of product you want to sell, how do you get these things? You have to do market research. Uh, there is another way that I'm going to talk about uh, later in future work that, that we may do that. OK, so final thing. So now they, the buyer sees this, this graph, and now they can do whatever they want, right? They basically can choose what point they want to buy. If they have a budget, they can go and find the best accuracy they can buy with that budget. If they have a preferred accuracy, they can find a cheaper uh, model that gives them this accuracy. You buy this point. You, uh, uh, basically, what, what the, the broker will do, it will add the random noise, return the model, and then the buyer will pay, and that's it. OK? So that, that's how the market operates. OK, so great. So now what I want to talk is about the pricing function, right? How does the pricing function work? So let's, so f but if you have fixed a model, your data and your error function, then what you want your pricing function to depend on is on the expected error, right? And remember, this is an error over the randomness of the mechanism. So Again, that's the key point that I said before, that it does not depend on the actual error, but of the model instance that the buyer will get, but on the expected one. So you pick the according to the expected error. So now we're asking, OK, what kind of desired properties do we want to have of the pricing function? OK? 
The first one is really surprising. Price should always be positive, <laughs> OK? Uh, clearly, you, you, you do not want you know, buy, you buy a model and the market pays you, right? That makes no sense, OK? That's easy. Uh, so now things get a bit more interesting. So one thing you want is error monotonicity. What does this mean? This means that as your uh, error increases, you want also your, your price to, uh, to, to, not, to not increase, OK? So this means that if you plot the price as a function of your error, you want, you want this, uh, this graph to be monotone. So why is that? Because if not, then you could have what we call an arbitrary opportunity, right? You could be able to buy a model with a better accuracy for a cheaper price, OK? So you want to have this monotonicity. The second one you want is a generalization of this idea. And this is uh, what you ask, that you, do, you don't want, for example, that someone will come and buy five models of the same accuracy, average them uh, out, let's say, and then get a model that's going to be better accuracy for a cheaper price than buying directly for that better accuracy. Okay? So essentially, you don't want to, uh, the user to be able to fool the market and get something for a cheaper price. Okay? So intuitively, uh, well, here is what we want. It should not be possible to, to basically buy a cheaper set of models in total and then combine them in some way to construct a new, a new model with a smaller expected error than that you originally desired. Okay? And you can see that arbitrary sweetness implies error monotonicity because the case of error monotonicity is when your combination is only of one, of one model, one model instance. OK? Yes? Excellent question. So here we're talking only about one single uh, hypothesis space, right? So your ensemble is kind of working the same hypothesis space. OK? So yes, we're saying you, you will, we want to eliminate. I mean, you can still do ensemble, but what we're saying is that if you directly ask for the thing, uh, that that was a combination. You could actually not get. You could not gain anything by doing ensemble. That's what we're saying. But if you have different hypothesis space, then uh, doing ensemble is actually really interesting. And a very. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that in, in future questions. How 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 we can we can we can do that. Um, what but yeah. Intuitively, you can rephrase that as doing. Uh, you know, an, an ensemble. Uh, will not gain anything. Will not gain you anything in this case. Okay. Good. So example. So here is a, imagine you have this curve, and then you have this point that you know costs 20, 30, right? So you can take these two models and then say you know you take them, average them out, or do something else, and then you have to make sure that basically anything that's uh, above 50 cannot give you a better accuracy than the combination of these two things. OK? Questions? Yes? Do you mean just linear combination, or you mean any, any way to compute a new model? Any, any way to compute a new model. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean that you ideally, you would want that. And we can actually show we can have this guarantee okay. that for any, any way you can try to do that, you, you won't be able to do that. OK. But of course, uh, the intuition is because we're adding Gaussian noise, the best way to combine is to do a linear combination. Well, I, I looked at this at some point, and it's not clear. So if you want to, if you have multiple, multiple averages and you want to compute a better estimate, it's not clear that yeah, the average is the best, best estimate. I, I, I should take this offline because I don't remember exactly. So the all this works because you're adding Gaussian noise. And but then what you, when you're averaging out, you're averaging Gaussian noise, and that behaves very nicely. Because when you add Gaussian noise, you get another Gaussian, right? So if you did that, in an average, you're not adding noise, right? You're talking about subsamples of your data. So you say you, you subsample this data, you compute the average, you subsample the data, you compute the other average, and you average them out. So I think the assumption is if I have uh, n samples of a random variable, mm -hmm. And all the, uh, the each random variable is a random noise according uh, added to some true value. Then what is my best estimate of the true value uh, um, computed uh, using these? And and you're you're claiming that the best the best estimate is to take the average. 
and I don't know if that's true. So I'm claiming that in the case that you're adding to the same variable Gaussian noise with where the only thing that changes is the variance, okay, uh, then doing a weighted average is the best thing you can hope for. So it's a much more specific claim. Uh, in your, your case, it's much more general, and yeah, yeah, you, I, don't th I think it's very hard to guarantee anything. So, so it goes back to combining estimators of things, right? So basically, we're saying the best estimator you can do is take the average in, in some case, OK? OK, so great. So, uh, so these are the price indices the data. So now the next thing we do is I want to talk about the randomized mechanism. So how do we actually uh, implement this randomized mechanism? So the idea is, is really simple. You compute the optimal model, and then you take the uniform d-dimensional Gaussian distribution with variance delta, which again is the one that controls your noise. You're, you're sampling a vector from that distribution, and you're adding it coordinate-wise to, to your model. And that's it. Okay, so extremely, extremely simple. Doing nothing fancy. Um, so by the way, notice the similarity of that in differential privacy, right? So differential privacy, you'd also have a vector, and then you could also sample uh, a vector from a random distribution, which now it's a Laplacian distribution, you would add it and you would return that. Okay? Um, and of course, you could. You could but, but, but here you're adding, you have many, many, random, random, many noise variables because they need to sam sample one for each dimension. Yes. Well, in, in, uh, in differential privacy, there is a single, a single noise that's being added at the very end. Well, it depends if you have a one dimensional or multi dimensional. Right. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah. No, but in some cases, you're right. So because you. Even if you are no adding noise coordinate wise, your randomness is, is on one coordinate essentially, right? So, so you don't need randomness on it. You can correlate them so you have one, one source of randomness in some sense. We, we can take that offline. Um, okay, so now what we can show is that, so the Gaussian mechanism, as you can see, has very nice properties. One is that, well, if your, uh, if your uh, loss function is convex, then we can show that this uh, behavior that I said that the noise control parameter with, uh, with expected error must be monotone, it holds, right? theoretically holds, OK? Good. So, so the other nice thing is that we can very nicely characterize uh, the, uh, the shape of the pricing function uh, if, we, if we use this, this very concrete mechanism, OK? So here is, here is our theorem. It is kind of the, uh, the main uh, theoretical statement of, of the paper is that the function is arbitrary free for the Gaussian mechanism if the falling hold for every parameter is delta 1, delta 2, delta 3. So the first one basically tells you that if one, the inverse of delta 1 is equal to the inverse of delta 2 plus one, the inverse of delta 3, then the price of that depends on delta 1 is smaller or equal than the price that depends on delta 2 and the price of delta 3. OK? Yes? So delta is a noise control parameter, the variance how much variance you're adding to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the second one is uh, monotonicity, essentially, right? So if you have a smaller variance, then you basically will have a higher, you want to have a higher price, OK? So, OK, maybe that's hard to read. So here is an easier way to think about it. If you define the pricing function not as a function of your noise, but as the inverse of the noise, then that the theorem tells you it must be subadditive and monotone. OK? And that's it. And we can show that's if and only if. OK? So in some sense, what this tells you is that if you have uh, two models with a uh, variance delta 2 and delta 3, then the best way you can combine them is by using a weighted average where you use the inverse, the inverse of your variance. Or something. You weight them by the inverse of the variance. OK? And you can't do any better than that. Questions? OK, so, so now what we've done with this is we've taken this very uh, abstract and hard kind of understand statement about arbitrary freeness and have, say, have a very concrete property about the shape of the pricing function, right? So this tells you that you know, when you want to compute a pricing function that, that trades this accuracy, then what you want to do is make sure it's monotone and subadditive, and that's the only thing you need to do. And then you have an absolute theoretical guarantee that no one can go and, and cheat the system and get something for a cheaper price. OK, so that ends the, the first. The, don't worry, the other three are much smaller than the first one. So yes? Just to make sure there's no difference with nonlinear models? There is a difference. 
So what we're losing with nonlinear models is that we don't have this, this very nice monotonic behavior between uh, your error and the noise you're adding. Okay. So essentially, you what, since we are, so here, right? What we're saying is that when we are in in the regime of where we're, we're plotting this over the noise control parameter, I mean we want that to be monotone, right? But now when you're translating back to the expected error, if your mapping is not monotone, then basically you're losing you're losing all your guarantees, in some sense. So you can get arbitrary because things behave non-monotonically when you map them back to the expected error. So that's why we can't we can't handle uh, nonlinear models if. If this, fun, if this mapping is not monotone, then we, we cannot go back to the regime of talking about the expected error. Okay. You're talking about linear models. Yes, generalized linear models. I mean, if you have a nonlinear model where you have this behavior, when you have, sorry, uh, this behavior, it still works. So that's what you want, right? But I mean, maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't happen, dep depending on the data you have. So yes? Also, you make this distinction between the error on the, tra on the training data and the yeah. error on the test data. And that distinction got lost at some point. So can you explain? Uh, yeah, so the theorem only says about the shape of the pricing function as a function of the, of the noise, right? In some sense. Okay. So now, w the idea is that when, OK, so how, how are you going to talk about arbitras here? Essentially, you map back in this regime and then you argue about the shape of the function in this regime, and then you can show that it basically translates, if it's, you have a monotone mapping, it translates across. Okay? Yeah, but then what confuses me is here you, here you have two errors. And, right. Uh, so the one, one right. One graph. So the, the expected error on the right is which error? Is it's it epsilon. Which but is when you're computing the optimal model, you're computing it with lambda, right? So you're computing the optimal model according to the function you do train on, but then you're plotting the error according to, to what you're testing on. Okay. Um, and you're going to ask why, why do you have this complication, but you actually need it because that's how people use, the, use their models. They're, they're training on a different error than they're testing. So, uh, so you, do, you do need this to, mod, to be able to model these two things to make things work. OK. Uh, OK, so the next thing I want to talk about is revenue optimization, right? So uh, we're, looking at, we're going to look at two, pr two concrete problems. The first one is called price interpolation. So suppose that you're given pairs of price and errors that you want to achieve, right? So let's say, suppose that the seller has something very specific in mind. And uh, then we're asking, you know, can you find an arbitrary free pricing function that satisfies the pairs, right? Equivalently, basically, this is asking is given a bunch of points, can you interpolate the subadiv and monotone function through these points? Okay. The second one is I'm giving you the value and demand curves. Can you basically find an arbitrary free function that, that maximizes revenue according to that? Okay. So, uh, not surprisingly, both problems are intractable. They're going to be hard. Okay. But we can actually show that we can have algorithms with very good approximation guarantees in particular constant approximation. And I won't go into details about this algorithm. You can look at the paper. What I want to do is I want to give you some intuition about why this is hard and, and, and how it works, right? So here is a, a toy example. So here I have, I've plotted my price against the inverse of the noise control parameter. Remember that here we want to be subadditive and monotone with respect to, this, to the inverse of that. So here we have four points, right? So this point is, you know, this is one and it has a price of 100. 50, 280, and so on. So the first thing you may, you may try in order to, uh, you know, to maximize your revenues is say, OK, I need to go through every point. Because as I said, if we go higher, then this guy will not buy it, right? Because its valuation is 100, and the price is more than it values. Yeah. And if it's lower, you're losing revenue because you could have priced it higher, and, and uh, the buyer will still have bought it. Okay? So you want to go exactly through these points. But now if you actually do that, then it's easy to see that this is not a, it's monotone, but it's not subadditive. Why? Because let's say you get, uh, you buy this one and this one, then that the sum is 250, and the, the sum of 1 and 2 is 3, right? So this is 280, which is more than 250, OK? Another subadditive example is if you buy two of these, you're going to get 304, which again is smaller than that. 
So this is not a subadditive, uh, right? It, 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 will, it will have arbitrage opportunities. So now you can try to say, OK, what if I try a constant pricing function? Okay, Is that going to help me? The answer, of course, is no, because here these two guys will never buy anything, right? And here I'm also losing revenue. The constant pricing function is always arbitrage free because it's subadditive and monotone, but you're losing revenue. The same thing is, you know, if I try to do a linear one, again, you can see that I'm losing these two, and here I'm also losing some revenue. So again, it's arbitrage free, but not what I want. Okay. Now, what is the optimal one? The optimal one has this really weird shape. Okay. You can trust me that this is the optimal arbitrage free pricing function you can you can have. What we do in practice, the approximation is we plot something like that. Can you go back one slide? Yeah. Why, uh, why, why did you stop? Uh, yeah, what's the meaning of that step? Here? No, you're going like that. So between 150 and between 2 and 3, between the, uh, the, the value of the price is somewhere between 150 and 280, and I don't really understand where it is. Where? What do you mean? Here? Yeah. Yeah, that value. What is it? Uh, I don't remember. I, have a, I, think it's a, I think it should be 2, 250, probably, because that's the sum of these two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so basically you want to go as high as 250, but not lower than 250, in some sense. Okay. Uh, Sorry, so that's not really a straight step, right? I mean, here? I want, yeah. Here, that's straight. Yeah, I mean, I have to redo it. <laughs> it's straight. It's a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> it's, pa it's PowerPoint's fault. <laughs> it's a straight line. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but it doesn't r quite go through 280, is the point. Here it goes through through 280 and then goes like that. So it's basically a step function, right? But you need to be careful when you're changing your step and how high. And I mean, it's really interesting. So the problem is hard because you're essentially solving a, a knapsack problem. Uh, so th that's why that's why basically we're doing the step and you have to consider more and more combination of sums and you have to have you have basically a lot of constraints. So that makes the problem hard. Now what we do is we actually do something like that. So we do some linear interpolation, and then we're uh, right. So we basically relax this problem to do some linear interpolation, and then we can show that basically you have a constant guarantee. So this is actually what our algorithm go we're going to give, and you can see that here you're getting the optimal one, and here you're using some you're losing some re revenue, but not too much. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So uh, a bit about experiments. So we ran some experiments synthetic on synthetic data in the USCI repository for ML. We tried linear regression, logistic regression. And the first thing we want to take is that we said, is this curve between the expected error and the noise control parameter indeed monotone, right, in practice? And you can see that we tried a bunch of different error square loss, zero one loss, logistic loss. And in all cases, it have this monotone behavior that, that we wanted. Uh, the next thing we want to take is, uh, is actually what we're doing meaningful, right? So we're talking about fine-grained pricing, but how does it compare against a function that's going to give a constant price to everything, right? Or just have a linear price? So is this complexity, all this complexity we're adding, worth it? Uh, and so we want to compare against these two pricings, one that is constant and one that's linear. And we want to compare against two measures. So one is, of course, revenue, how much revenue you're getting. The other one is the other point I talked about in the beginning is you know, uh, affordability, how many buyers can actually buy what they want, right? Because that, that was our two goals why we want to have this more fine grain pricing. So we defined as the percentage of buyers that actually bought why, wh what they desired, OK? So uh, I'll, I'm going to show you two experiments. So this is, we start with this buyer and value distribution. Right? Uh, val right, value and demand distribution. So here you can see how this goes. And basically, this is the demand. Okay? And here, uh, again, ideally, you, we would want to follow exactly this curve, but this is actually not subadditive. Okay? So what happens, you can see here that the red line is what we do. We fold it up to a point, and then a slope is, is smaller so that it satisfies the subadditive constraint. Okay? Um, and these, these are different pri this is constant pricing functions. So uh, you should look at uh, which one is that? Opt C, which is the optimal constant price. This is the best constant. The, the constant pricing gives you the optimal revenue. 
and this is some kind of linear interpolation, okay? And here this shows you that, you know, our method gets you the, the best revenue. Um, this is compared to the optimal constant price, and linear is really, really bad. And the other interesting thing is that this method also gives you a much bigger affordability, right, compared to the other methods. So here you can already see that with this constant price, even if it's good, it's actually good to lose everyone that is, that is under it, right? So you're getting no revenue from, from all of this. Yes? Again, these are, uh, yeah, these are synthetic, synthetic data. So we tried a bunch of different distributions to see how they behave. Uh, so this is one, one of the examples. Yes? Is that a one on the model-based pricing affordability ratio? Yeah. So every buyer buys Yeah, so it. if your curve is under this one, everyone will buy. Because you're selling everything under, under the buyer's value, right? So everyone will buy. Make sense? So if, so this is how much you're willing to pay, right? If the, if the price of everything is under what you're willing to pay, you'll always buy it. So the affordability is one. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, the, one, uh, the other one that's really interesting is that, so here we have this shape, and again, here is the, uh, um, how the, the value behaves according to, to that one. And again, here you can see that it's not subadditive. So uh, the red one, you can't see it very well, but this is what, the, what our algorithm returns. And again, here you can see that you get a better revenue and uh, a, better, a better affordability, although here the gap is it's much smaller, right? So constant price here is, is not doing that bad. Okay, the optimal constant price is, is not doing that bad. Yes? How filtered are the results of the buyer distribution and uh, the buyer preferences? Uh, so they, they depend. So we tried a bunch of different, I mean, we didn't have enough space in the paper, but we, we basically tried a bunch of different uh, distributions to see what happens. And you know, there are cases where you're doing much better than the constant pricing. But you know, in, a, in a case where basically the values are like that or have a very small slope, then I mean, clearly constant pricing would do pretty well, right? There are cases where the differences are more extreme, where you want to be more fine-grained to get, to get more revenue. Right? So, so it depends. So it is, they are sensitive. Uh, but in all of them, we are, we are doing better, of course. I mean, we would expect you to do at least as good, but uh, because you know, constant pricing is, is a subadditive and monotone pricing, right? So uh, if that was optimal, that's what we would find. Yes? I guess you did marketing research to figure out that these are potentially true, like, in main curves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's really, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know how to get this data. It's a very good question. Uh, it would be awesome if we had this data. I don't know how to get it. Um, so key points uh, from the experiments. So fine grain pricing, greasings, both the revenue and affordability. For linear models, we can theoretically guarantee that we have arbitrary freeness. OK, so it's an absolute guarantee. Uh, and we can also do revenue optimization efficiently, okay, by doing this approximation. So uh, I want to conclude with some future work and interesting open open problems. So as we said, what we have here only works for linear models where you have a nice behavior between adding noise and and increasing error. So the question is, okay, what happens if you go to more complex models where you have nonlinear behaviors? What what can you do in this case? So that's one. Second one is, suppose you don't have any prior, prior uh, market research data, okay? So what can you do? So one idea here is, and there's a huge literature uh, in the theory community about that, is you essentially do online learning of the price, right? So imagine a scenario where I start with setting some prices, and then as I learn, I see, you know, uh, did this buyer buy or not, right? And then I, I change, I modify them as I learn, to convert to the optimal pricing function. Okay, so in some sense, the operation of my market is going to give me giving information about uh, uh, market uh, is doing the market research to see what kind of are the optimal prices. Okay, and here these are um, uh, type of, this type of problems are essentially arm, arm banded problems, and there is a lot of research on that and how you can bond the regrets, so how much the market is losing by doing this this learning and how we can minimize it and, and so on, right? So that could be, 
a practical way you could apply that without even having any prior information about, about these uh, demand and value curves. Um, this, I think, is the most interesting but most challenging problem is how do you actually go from a fixed model, right, reasoning about pricing for fixed model, to reasoning about pricing across different model and hypothesis spaces. So for example, you know, what if you want to do feature selection, right? So now you don't have a, a, fixed, a fixed vector that depends on features, but you can actually choose, choose the features. Uh, or what if you have different models and you want to reason about arbitrage about different models, ensemble, you know, doing ensemble methods as, as you asked, and so on. How do you even reason about arbitrage in these cases, right? So these are really hard questions that uh, unfortunately don't have theoretical tools. I mean, ML, ML, uh, uh, the ML community does not have theoretical tools to, to deal with these cases. Um, so it either requires like a, a practical solution or you know, something that will come without any theoretical guarantees. Um, and the final one is, you know, are there any interesting connections between our mechanism and differential privacy, right? So in some sense, we are adding noise to a result, right? So this is what you would do if you want to release a differential private uh, vector. Um, so you know, can we say something about that? Are there any interesting connections? Um, so that's it. Thanks, everyone, for your nice questions. And yeah, feel free to ask more questions if, if, you, if you want to. Thanks, Barry. Yes. So how does this market model change if you actually think of you know giving uh, or uh, pricing predictions instead of the model itself? Like uh, you know you don't give the model to the customer or the buyer. Rather, you actually you know allow him to ask for a particular prediction and great. Just predict yeah. one. Great, great question. Mm -hmm. So this is something I, I've I've thought about, and you could see that as a microservice, right? Right. So yeah. you're, you're right. For example, Google also has APIs. Yeah, on yeah, the side. yeah. So you could do that, and that would require a completely different market, of course, where you could offer these microservices. The other question is, I think the interesting problem there is, you know, if you ask enough things, are you going to learn the model that you're selling and how, how you deal with this situation? So maybe by uh, asking enough predictions, you get enough training data that you can train your own model, right? So yeah, th I think that's a very, that's a very interesting another type of market that, that could work as well. Yeah, I think in that case, uh, pricing or buying from sellers is going to be harder. Right. Let's say you're able to buy from different sellers of different data quality. Mm -hmm. And how do you actually, what is the asking price for a particular seller data? Yeah. And that's yeah. a more challenging question. I mean, the sellers, you have to give statistics about their, their accuracy, right, of their models. Yeah. And then you have to trust them, of course. Yeah. So you need some trusted entity that's basically going to compare these models for you and tell you, you know, yeah. this guy's better, you know, if your data is that, you gotta go there and, and so on. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting scenario. Okay.